debris and such, and that all needs to be cleaned out. Um, this is a, again, the 42 foot diameter um, tunnel. This is about 20 miles. It's a little over 20 miles in length. Um, just to give you a little feel of this, everyone knows the channel between France and England. Um, same amount of rock would come out of this thing as, between, as the channel between France and England. Um, the, the channel is considered one of the seven modern wonders of the world. So this is, this is giving you a perspective. This is not big for New Jersey or the U.S. This is big, big. It's, it's monumental. Oh, oh, can you go back one more? Um, this is uh, work shaft number two. Um, I surprised uh, the dean when I said, do you know where that thing's proposed to go? That's on Montclair State University's campus. <laughs> and I said, that'd probably be an attraction for your engineering and your science people, but I'm not sure you want this you know, 45 foot hole in, in the middle of your campus. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't build a building on it yet. It's still, it's still vacant space, but I'm not, that was a surprise to them. And obviously, we all know that the Pacific Basin is vulnerable to flooding, but is flooding really the actual problem? As a policy major, when we propose policy solutions, you have to know what the problem is that you're addressing. And this is a map of the hot spots in the region, and what these um, geographic areas represent are large concentrations of severely repetitive loss and repetitive loss properties. And this is a pretty good um, map because it shows here Little Falls, uh, Fairfield, here's part of Lincoln Park, and here's Wayne. This is the mall in Wayne, if anyone's familiar with this area. And it starts to show here that um, the repetitive loss areas is that, you know, is flooding the actual problem here or is it our development practices? And this leads me to a quote by Gilbert Fowler White, who's oftentimes considered the father of floodplain management. And I think it embodies a lot of what I observed this summer while researching the Passaic Basin. And it says, floods are acts of God, but flood losses are largely acts of man. And essentially, for decades, uh, towns and interests within the Passaic Basin have engaged in highly irresponsible land use and development practices. You know, they've developed in areas they should not develop in, floodplains, sometimes floodways. Uh, they've destroyed wetlands and natural flood storage areas. They've uh, covered the basin with impervious <coughs> coverage. And this has really just intensified their vulnerability to flood losses. And the bottom line that I've um, really gathered this summer is that the Pacific Basin has a land use problem, not a flooding problem. Uh, floods are floods. You know, it's, nature is just, you can't control nature. You can adapt to nature. You can learn from nature. And you can try to prepare to nature, but you can't control it. And I think the diversion tunnel study kind of has, um, kind of doesn't address the real issue that's going on in the base. It's kind of a magic bullet approach. And you can put a tunnel in there and you can kind of um, continue your development practices. But as with most environmental problems, and most problems in general, there's going to need to be sacrifices made in order to achieve a desirable outcome. Uh, some towns, they're going to have to reevaluate their master plans, their development practices, their building codes. And uh, some people are going to have to relocate their homes. Some people are going to have to elevate them. That's just the bottom line. And I'll let John kind of talk about some of the other policy issues outside of the tunnel that the uh, advisory commission is working on. Uh, another speaker in the room is going to talk about higher standards. But this has been a big issue. Um, there's been um, interest, I, I guess, in, in lowering standards, even after we just had a flood in March. Um, so this is something that, that is near and dear to me and, and sort of uh, and, and increasing. I, I actually think the mapping in this basin is, is now old. Um, we may have already eaten into some of the higher standards. I really believe that's true. I actually think that we're going to find that a lot of these um, extra heights and extra uh, uh, flow values will, will have actually eaten into that. Um, I'm still running some analysis in, in the basin, but um, there's still been a lot of develop in, development in the floodplain in the last 15 years, despite this being a really, really famous uh, floodplain. Um, there's been still more intensification of development in the floodplain. Um, a big thing that's come out with acquisitions, you always have the fear of an elected officials will be like, well, we're losing our rateables, we're losing our tax base. So this 
issues come up, and actually from a national standpoint, I've been talking with some people, and there's no, from what we can find right now, there's no definitive source to find out this whole buyouts versus tax base. If you talk to a first responder who at 3 o'clock in the morning needs to go out in the dark and, and, and evacuate someone, they're going to say there's some value in not having to do that. I mean, they're putting their own mm -hmm. lives at risk. Um, there's the issue of, um, you know, repetitive flood-prone uh, properties are, are basically, people could, could uh, you know, uh, default on their mortgage. They may, they may have lost everything. They may not be able to keep up, and they're just hit over and over again. And then, you know, is that property really providing that tax revenue that, you know, and, and are you providing additional services as a town um, that, that, you know, they're, they're really, you're getting less in the way of taxes than you're getting, um, than, than, than the buyout um, that, that costs you. Um, so basically that's where the Green Acres comes in, the Blue Acres program of Green Acres um, in, in compensating people for, for leaving. But, this whole buyouts and tax space we're getting into, um, and, and that needs to be further research um, because it is such a, uh, it, it's a perceived disincentive for buyouts at this time. Any questions at all? Comments? Yeah, yeah great. I'm not real familiar with the basin, but um, we heard the speaker this morning, the first speaker in the plenary, talking about elevations. Is that part of the mix of things? Are, are we looking at elevations here yes. in a big way? Yeah, it just, or um, all buyouts? A, a grant was just announced for elevating homes in uh, in Little Falls. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of that compromise because you're not eliminating the risk, but you're also not eliminating the tax revenue. And it's sort of, a lot of elected officials are more comfortable with elevations than they are with buyouts. So yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, elevations will very much help the National Flood Insurance Program, which is really an insurance program. There are still disruptions to other things in a community when elevations occur. But I, I think it's a good technique that needs to be, you know, we need to do more of that in the Passaic Basin. Yeah, speaking now as a as a Little Falls resident, yep. <laughs> um, being kind of at the center of all this, you know, one concern that we kind of have in town, and, and I don't know how it's being addressed, we're concerned that the that the flood tunnels, Tennessee is probably a good word, is, is being seen as the only long term structural solution to the problems that we that we suffer, not just in our community, but also you know Wayne and Totowa and, and, and Lincoln Park. Yep. Has there has there been any? real thought given to other structural solutions, obviously including policy-wise, but any, any other structural solutions or long-term financially feasible structural solutions? Yeah, when, when I looked at the Corps' comprehensive plan, they certainly don't just have a tunnel, they have the flood walls and levees where space, or even really where there was no space, but they were kind of forced in. But I, I, think, I think there is some merit in looking at, at that. Um, and looking at the, their use in certain areas, for you know, there's uh, Matt showed that hot spots, and there's an area in that um, Signac area where you know yeah. some, some something other than just buyouts and elevations might be appropriate in that area. Would it be possible just to target my home? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the cost savings would be astronomical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, subtle. So. a lot on that. Yeah, we no, can sign it up right now. Yeah. Focus it. So I can show you on the map specifically where it would be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no offense, Wayne. <laughs> Wayne second. Right, right, right. Put your house on springs. Yes, Bob. Um, in in karst areas, I know that all, that are just big tunnels. Uh, pollution is a real issue, and uh, these are kind of magnets for for you know, pollution that hasn't been filtered, that you know, hasn't been biologically addressed. How are you going to handle pollution? Just, uh, the it's it's treated or just, uh, it's a big issue. The, the <coughs> dean, uh, Dean Bob Prezant, that's on the commission, has the um, Benfic background, and he's been looking at the environmental impact statement. He's been looking at the update to that. He's been looking at uh, a couple of the core guys put a paper together when the project was officially sort of not moving. They went ahead with a paper. So he's been let's put it this way, critical of some of the findings of the EIS for the project, and a lot of them have to do with the discharges to Newark Bay. Okay. 
So there's no treatment at all? It's just there would be no treatment. It's, it's a purely conveyance system, so that's right. Yeah? I have a couple questions about the commission. Yeah. At that year period, does that end in December? We end. We're done. And, and that report, can we all see it? Sure, yeah, it's going to be a public report. Um, well, you know what? I shouldn't say that. I'm not the I'm not the governor, so I'm, we're we're reporting to the governor. I'm guessing that it will be a public document at that time, and it's it's going to be really the governor's call on what happens next. So they're just like recommendations. There will be yeah, there will be findings, recommendations, that type of thing. I can't tell you. It's not that I can't tell you, but I I I don't know everything that we're going to cover. But it's going to be it's going to be a comprehensive report. I'm sure. John, just the two comments on uh, yeah. Bob's point about the, the pollution issue. That's why Hudson County, you know, went ballistic as early on that. You know, as if they don't have enough trouble in that part of the watershed with dioxin and PCBs, and then you see this. Yeah. Tunnel. But just hearing the the length of time this has been studied and the amount of money that has gone into the study, and not even talking about what it would cost to build, and operate, maintain it, it would be interesting for uh, perhaps an intern somewhere to look at all the dollars and. Try to uh, relate that to how much other work could have mm -hmm. been accomplished in, in buyouts, <laughs> elevation, <laughs> using the dollar, eight, nineteen eighty dollars, ninety dollars, right. because it's all about dollars now. And if you yeah. can argue dollars to folks, everybody gets it because they will speak that language. It might be an interesting uh, tidbit to bring to the discussion because it gets out of this narrow focus of where are we today or this election cycle, and it looks at what we should look at, which is long, long term. Yeah, yeah, annualized. Um, yeah, we, we and we are looking. At, we are looking at the cost of all of this. What I didn't mention is back in '95, the estimates were in the three billion dollar range or so. We're probably you know ten or more billion dollars for this comprehensive plan. Um, so it's it's a it's a very large, uh, very large expenditure, and we're certainly looking at what Mark suggests is. is the components of that comprehensive plan and all the things we're doing, we're looking at their costs. Yeah. I'm not familiar with the project, but I think in, in addition to the dollars, what would be helpful is something else somebody could see, uh, the, the people that are living there, is how many feet is this coming down? Right. What's the bang for the buck? Right. Right. Does, does, is that known now? I mean, that the models must have been done for them. There, there were inundation mapping. There was inundation mapping done by the Corps when they when they proposed this comprehensive plan. Uh, what has changed since '95 to today? Of course, we had a Katrina. We had other things. Um, a lot of the standards have been raised, such as overtopping of levees, and um, a lot of these systems would have to be reevaluated because of today's standards versus ones 15 years ago. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of people, you'll see in the media, everyone's like, well, there's studies have been done. No, I, I disagree. This, some studies have been done. Um, some of the studies need to be updated. Yeah. Did the commission ever look at a policy similar to the one they have in South Carolina on the, on the ocean front, where if you're in an existing home, you have flood insurance. If your house is wiped out by a hurricane or by the ocean rising, they will pay you the money to replace your home, but you, you can't rebuild it there. You're out. And you leave. If you decide to rebuild it, you are no longer eligible for any insurance. Interesting. And I, I've never heard that ever mentioned in New Jersey. If new, new, yeah. new properties that want to go in those areas, they try to do it then. <laughs> If they want to build it, they do not get feasible, so it's their own risk. I want to talk to you afterward. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> do we have time for one more question? Does anyone else want to ask? Okay. Um, thanks. Guys, thank you so much.